way too big of a sip and burn my mouth and my throat and everything. Is, is it just hot water? Uh, a lot of stuff in it, but. Oh. Uh, <laughs> everyone's wa- This is live. Everyone, <laughs> everyone's seeing this. <laughs> You never said we were alive. You were burning too busy burning your mouth. Uh, it's like the Peter Griffin that. Uh, 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 this is a strong start. This is a strong. I start. leave for like a handful of minutes and everything uh, goes. He's to got heck. third degree burns on his tongue. How did this happen? Ah, uh, I was trying to chug it quickly before we started. Okay, well, let's start the recorded version of the audio podcast for you live viewers that you got a little taste of um behind the behind the curtain <clears throat> welcome back to switchcast live i'm your host doug tabbitt and switchcast is the automotive related podcast where we are searching for the truth and the humor in the car industry even if the humor is at our own expense which isn't it usually though yeah, yeah pretty much <laughs> it's more fun that way i'm a i'm an easy target if it ain't true, it better be funny. Uh, that's right. Switchcast is automotive wisdom with a side of sarcasm, or vice versa, depending on the week. Uh, I'm your host, Doug Tabbitt, and uh, with me tonight is Tyler Sanders and our producer and uh, comment screener, Ethan Huffnagel. That's right. If you're watching live, throw those comments in, and we'll do our best to uh, engage with you and answer your questions tonight. We do have a Big show, though, lots of material to cover, so we'll do our best to get through it fantastically. Uh, We have models on the show tonight. Uh, It's not what you're thinking. We have not turned into the Howard Stern show, but uh, for those of you watching on the video, uh, you can see we've got some Lamborghini and a Bugatti uh, in front of us. And that is in honor of Marcello Gandini, who passed away uh, last week, actually, uh, before the show last week, but we forgot to mention it. Uh, Marcello Gandini was, um, forgive my American pronunciation of his name, but uh, I butcher the pronunciation of pretty much everything. But anyway, he was a legendary designer, uh, most notably for Bertone uh, design, and he uh, penned some of my favorite cars of all time, some very legendary cars. He uh, designed the Countach, Lamborghini Diablo, and the Bugatti EB110, which all are gracing our presence here in 118th scale. He invented the scissor door. Oh, immediate Hot. automotive royalty. Like we're, We all knew this, but just... Ugh. So good. Honda Civic owners everywhere rejoice, even though you don't know where it came from. <laughs> I got mine for I got my hinges from AutoZone. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, well, thank an old Italian guy. Um, he also penned some of the ugliest cars ever made, or ugliest Lamborghinis ever made. Sorry, uh, the the uh, pretty much every. 70s Lamborghini besides the the Countach was pretty pretty bad um but yeah he he uh, yeah he left this world last week but uh let's take a moment in, of silence in memory of, of his fantastic designs and on that note that rest I guess if it was written into a music thing not a oh, note hey uh, Music jokes. We want to add, that <laughs> we wanna add a, a, a new uh, bit to our uh, show as we can fit it in every week, and that is the listener spotlight. Uh, of course, we give a shout out to our sponsors who are supporting the show, but ultimately, you as our listeners are supporting the show because um, if you think of it, without our listeners, we would have no sponsors, but without our sponsors, we would still have listeners. So the listeners, you, the listeners, really are the most important thing to this show. Uh, And you let us know sometimes how much you love it, and we thank you for that. And this week we had a few things. So one of them, uh, actually a few weeks ago, and I didn't cover this yet, but Hayden Kapanen reached out to us. And that name probably doesn't mean anything to anybody, but... Uh, a while ago, we highlighted a 800,000 mile uh, BMW 2002 that was owned by a single family. Uh, it was passed along uh, when the original owner died to his uh, heirs. 
and we thought that that was really, really cool, all the memories that were made in that car. So Hayden is the grandson of the original owner, and he is enjoying that car, driving it. He sent uh, he sent me some videos of him enjoying it, and I just thought that was super cool. Uh, it's a really great way um, that his grandfather continued the legacy of automotive enjoyment to future generations, kind of a total opposite of just him parking in a museum and putting signs on it like Corvette curmudgeon signs like look but don't touch so no lot all of, well no no never mind I was, I was gonna say like all of the touching but that's a weird sentence to say but I just mean like use use the stuff you can make so many more memories that way um, just touch your BMW a bunch <laughs> We're also wishing a happy birthday yesterday to a uh, loyal listener and previous guest, Jay Roberts, also known as Cannonball Prius or Gonzo Prius. Oh. Uh, and another loyal listener, Jim Ryder, sent us a bottle of Buffalo Trace. So hey. thanks, Jim. Can make the noise here. Uh, yeah. you know, that was the, the, the most subtle pop. cork pop. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's about ASMR. Yeah, uh, there we go. A little boozy ASMR. Boozy. All right. <laughs> so we are cheersing to Jim Ryder tonight. So thank you, Jim. Uh, we love all you guys. And uh, again, if you got great comments or questions, throw those in there. If you have terrible ones, you can throw them in there too. Ethan will just be the judge of what makes it on. So, yeah. um, speaking of Lamborghini, since we're on that subject, uh, with uh, remembering Marcelo Gandini, there is a. Lamborghini Diablo Roadster on, I put in my notes, eBay. It's on Bring a Trailer uh, this week, and it is somewhat of a lesson on how not to present your car for sale. It just immediately went to, like, utter disaster in the comments. <laughs> I love how fast this unfolded and how spectacularly. Now, now, don't have too much fun at the expense of the seller he's 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 trying his best to, to keep this thing together but there was two major odor oversights the the first one was that the main photo on this listing the front trunk was popped which again who cares it's just like man take the time to close that thing because otherwise it looks funny people will be like hey what's wrong with it what's wrong with the gap is the carbon wrecked no it's just somebody didn't latch it before they took the pictures but the more egregious photo was one showing the car running with the water temperature gauge pegged solidly in the red zone. A place, I mean, they this thing is stuck there like the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> it's oh, and the is the oil temp normal? That one the looks maybe a little. The oil temp is normal. High. Yeah, the but, water temp high. Uh, yeah, it is overheating it was definitely i mean that I, I know it's called the diablo but that engine is in hell <laughs> gosh uh <laughs> did you see the ex the partial explanation i'm sorry if i'm cutting you off yeah but. go for it so at some point in the comments he stated that it was only like this after idling for an hour while he was taking photos right because the fans aren't working yes which okay Fans get fixed, good to go. Why are you leaving the car running when you're taking photos? Especially something like this. It needs movement. It's not your a Honda Accord that can idle for, you know, hours and be fine. Better question, why did you post the photo? <laughs> or yes. I mean, listen, if you're going to overheat an engine on Diablo, just be like, I'm not going to put that photo up. Yeah, it's very easy to hit delete. Right. <laughs> Turn the car off and right. take it again. <laughs> Don't self-incriminate yourself. It's the Fifth Amendment protects again. It's these types of things, but you volunteered the information on bringing trailer. And of course, I mean, it didn't take but an hour for the commenters to, uh, to pick up on this. And, um, uh, anyway, so uh, another excuse he made, which I thought was interesting was that, um, uh, the trunk wasn't closed and these photos were taken the way they were because he hired a photography company. He paid somebody else to take the pictures. And I'm like, dude, you should definitely get your money back on that one. <laughs> yeah, goodness. Right. If, if they're the ones that left the car running and now it's potentially allegedly damaged, we don't know. 
Yeesh. He says it's not damaged. He did tow it to a shop, and they repaired the cooling fans, and he claims that there's no engine damage. But I think the damage has already been done, proverbially, on the auction, yes. because people are just like, it's a red flag, no pun intended, <laughs> on this red Diablo. The um, comments are like one of those infomercials where they're like talking about cabinet organizers and somebody opens it and just their dishes fall out and they're trying to catch them all <laughs> and everything's like they're shattering on the ground. Like that's the comments. Go. It's a fun read. Yeah. I I don't know. The that, bid is still up to 200K. It, it started there. It hasn't moved since this, this started. But um, yeah, I mean, just the photos in general. It was on a It was on a dirt parking lot and the lighting was not great and the trunk was left open and the car was overheating and you know, usually when I pay someone to do something, it's so that it gets done better than I could do it myself, which is, I'll be honest, pretty much everything. I pay a lot of people to do a lot of things because I have a very narrow skill set. Um, but uh, yeah, in this case, I would have taken my own dang photos with a phone. I think I could do it better with a phone. Speaking of doing things with a phone, let's go to a commercial. Because SwitchCast is brought to you by BoxCast. BoxCast is a live streaming company based in Cleveland, Ohio, and they serve broadcasters and viewers around the world. Their founders launched BoxCast back in 2013 with one purpose, to make people a part of the experience. So if you're looking to live stream your podcast, church service, car show, sporting event, wedding, or even your cannonball attempt, BoxCast is an easy and flexible live streaming platform for organizations. BoxCast is so easy, in fact, that we're broadcasting this show with a phone. So head on over to switchcars.com slash BoxCast for your free trial. Man, I missed having your voice doing those ad reads. It's How did he do last week? Was he okay, Doug? You can be honest. Not he he was same. fine. It, <laughs> didn't, <laughs> it didn't cut the mustard it's like this. Fine. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I can cut your mustard, Ethan. Well, I'm Yikes. Nice, but, you know. Do you grind his beans? <laughs> Uh, yeah. <clears throat> Speaking so, <laughs> of grinding beans, yes. another listener spotlight. We have a potential sponsor here that sent us some product to try out. So we're going to do one of those unboxings. Oh, yeah. We got some, some coffee here from a local uh, coffee company and uh, Coffee Grounds. Um, I only drink decaf, so I'm not going to be trying it because I get all jittery if I drink caffeinated coffee. But Ethan and Tyler are going to be checking this coffee out and seeing if it... Uh, passes muster yeah if, if it cuts the mustard like it, exactly, it, it, yeah. right. i'm excited i'm really pumped to give out a shot that'll be my uh, morning brew tomorrow i yes. i love some some locally roasted coffee and some to support our, our friends in coffee so i i hope it's good yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, it'll be great it's really too bad hank isn't here we could give him some free coffee that he could try instead of his folgers that's see if not it was yeah, better I, I don't know if he'd be into that i'm not I, sure he'd we'll be into ever. free he, he would be into free that's i don't think he'd ever buy it though mm-hmm. i don't know what it costs but i guarantee darn it it's <laughs> <laughs> more than a, a gallon of folgers <laughs> for <laughs> Oh, what are you going to do? Speaking of Hank, Hank isn't here tonight, but what do we got that's uh, Corvette curmudgeon So we've got a uh, Facebook Marketplace listing uh, for a Corvette. Ooh. Uh, Doug, I think you might like this, though. So let's uh, go to, into this with an open mind, can we? All right. Was this listed on the Corvette Buy Sell Trade Group, your source for overpriced Corvettes and stereotypes? Reinforced stereotypes <laughs> and cranky yeah, yeah. boomers. Cranky boomers <laughs> there it is. Stereotypes. Ethan's got to memorize. I wrote that line. I, that I can't line. even remember it. It makes me laugh every Why, time. yes, it was. <laughs> All right. <laughs> awesome. So, <laughs> Doug. Let's hear it. For you tonight, yes. I have a 2020 Chevrolet C8 Corvette 3LT Z51 package carbon spec. All right. Long Beach Red Metallic. Ooh. Rare burgundy. color. It's, it's a good red. It is like, a rare color. It Do is. they say rare color? Oh, yes, with asterisks. Because <laughs> they can't bold in Facebook Marketplace, so they got to do the asterisks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. After consulting with the Corvette Museum in Kentucky, this Corvette has found to be a very rare specimen. Mm. Wait a First minute. First bullet point. Very rare? Very rare specimen. But not a one of one. Yeah. So ooh. it's really not that rare. <laughs> Oh, uh, but there's some more stuff that, that maybe makes it a little bit more interesting. Okay. This C8 was created a month prior to mass production and was not sold to the general public. Uh, uh, okay, hold that thought. I, I'm pretty sure 
Somebody can check me on this, but I'm pretty sure that was because of a stop sale due to a faulty front trunk latch. Oh, wait, so really? they like produced them and then stop sailed them. So they were making them, but not releasing them to the public. It wasn't like any pre-production car. It was just, oh, I was about to be like, is this a press car or something? Like, no! did, they, did that actually happen? Yes. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Guarantee you it's on his, his little, uh, his little board he puts out in front of the car shows. Uh, this C8 has an extremely early VIN number with a January 3rd of 2020 completion date. The C8 was not released to the public for purchase until February 3rd, 2020. Yeah. I think that was the trunk latch issue. That's amazing. That makes me so happy. People on the audio podcast cannot see how deeply my eyes are rolling on in the back of my head. (laughs) Oh man. So this C8 is one of 912 made prior to public sale and one of 83 made in 2020 of its spec. That's less rare than I thought it was. Yeah, that's, that's that's super not rare. That's a letdown. I'm just dis- even Ethan's disappointed. I, I, I really am. Yeah. Uh, in case you couldn't read the owner's manual or the dealer manual or or whatever, uh, Z51 package includes stickier tires, uh, which means that has a softer compound to grab the road. Uh, revised suspension tuning, which means it has exceptional smoothness on the road and still deliver race car handling, tour, sport, and track. Uh, this is all typed out, by the way. Okay. And aerodynamics, equipped with front spl- splitter, rear spoiler. Uh, oh, I forgot to let you know earlier that the Stellar states this C A well can very C eight can very well be one of the first in its spec to roll off the assembly line from Bowling Green, Kentucky. There's a lot of like maybes in there. It can very well be the first one. But it's one of 88 made in 2020. It's a very rare specimen, but not a one of one. It might be the first one in its spec. Who even cares if it's the first in its spec? I mean, this is this is not Corvette curmudgeon rare. At least they have the only one in that spec, however far you have to delineate it. Like, this guy doesn't even know if it's the first one in his spec. And honestly, it just oh, seems gosh. like a nice car. Like, I don't understand what the... So, there's more here. Let me let me get through okay. the rest of this. Okay. All right. Uh, it's got some more power. Uh, it's got carbon fiber seats, flash accent, accents, carbon fiber interior package, carbon fiber engine covers. Uh, PA inspection is current and valid. Ohio title is in his name. Little weird. Uh, ooh. Uh, rebuilt title. Oh. oh. That is rare. I didn't see that coming. That is <laughs> what? rare. Uh, okay. He really buried the lead there, though. Uh, inspected in Pennsylvania. <laughs> Rebuilt with all new parts, have all documentation. Uh, Uh, Vehicle was just serviced with a clean bill of health. Hold on. You stated a ways back that he noted that the Z51 package had stickier tires, meaning a softer compound to grab the road. Yeah, that is verbatim. I'm thinking it didn't work too well (laughs) if he still wrecked it. Honestly, yeah. He needed the the more stickier tires. Yeah, like the extra sticky. Like the Z06 package or something (laughs) like that. I guess that the Z51 package didn't fix the driver. <laughs> I'm not sure it was ever purported to do that. So this guy was, he was just not, not in a good place to begin with. Uh, the dealer has performed a fresh oil change and the transmission was topped off. God bless. Oh, he didn't. No, he didn't. <laughs> really? 100%. God bless. Capital G, capital B, period. Right at the end of the listing. Oh my gosh. That's good. That is, that is a reinforced stereotype right there. God like, bless. <laughs> rare corvette should have read it like that That's 51 package rebuilt title god bless god. <laughs> no low ballers so i god do bless. love g-o-b-b-l-e-s-s <laughs> god bless, god bless. <laughs> uh he did list uh, earlier in the li- i skipped over it that some ratings uh, the exterior is a 9 out of 10 interior 8 out of 10 engine 10 out of 10 i don't know how many of that can be true <laughs> with a rebuilt title <laughs> it's all new parts <laughs> It's all new parts. Probably just like his wife. Hey, oh, remember? <clears throat> what? Oh, I don't even think I told you how much they're asking. How much are they asking? Uh, $65,000. That's a lot. You can get a clean title one for that. <laughs> Hank would be very disappointed. <laughs> uh, uh, Hank would have a lot of words in the Corvette <laughs> buy sell trade group about how overpriced that was and yammering on about how he could buy a new one for that with a GMA plan and there there would be a lot of, I'm sure there were some Corvette curmudgeons ripping this guy a new one. If he if Hank knew how to use the uh, the internet and technology, he'd sure be in there. Oh, I, I think, think it's he probably does. <laughs> one one finger at a time on the keyboard. 
All caps. It just takes them a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. Um <laughs> speaking of speaking of selling well or not well, it seems to be a consistent theme here, but I mean we are here to help people learn how to buy and sell better, so that's why we uh, tend to focus on some of these. There was a 997 GT3 RS on Renless listed last week uh, that I ended up digging into a wee bit because I knew a wee bit about it and wanted to find out more. And the seller noted something the effect of, I don't think it's ever been tracked, but he made an allusion to a previous owner and their build thread on Renless where they had changed the graphics colors. But that was all he mentioned. Well, that build thread was dug up, and the previous owner's username and license plate was Track Car. And this build thread <laughs> did mention that he changed the graphics colors, but also mentioned that he changed almost everything else to build it into a track car. And it had like, he did like 14 track days. So whatever, no big deal, right? It track Tracking a GT3 RS does not hurt it, although it will kill the ceramic brakes, and they do have a weak second gear and a weak limit slip differential and a weak vario cam system where the bolts can back out and harm the engine. So, th actually, there are a lot of things that can get hurt on a GT3 RS by tracking it. However, I digress. Uh, the next owner, who I happen to know, had about 100 track days or 100 hours on track. It was unclear because... Um, but he also had a, an off on track at Mid-Ohio and damaged the rear bumper and rear fender. So this car, which was purported to supposedly not have any track time, had a ton of track time. A lot of track time had the transmission rebuilt. Like, But then it was CPO. They put it all back to stock. Porsche dealer sold it as CPO. That's a whole nother discussion for a whole nother episode about whether or not CPO is worth it and what it does or does not mean or protect you from um but i think the 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 current point that i think is important here is that whether or not this guy really knew about the history and intended to cover it up or just couldn't remember and was blissfully ignorant you know it's fine the point is that the information is there the car used to be a track rat for lack of a better term, and now it's being presented as pristine. And this happens over and over again as vehicles, interesting vehicles, become collector vehicles when they transition into this quote-unquote asset class, right? Bleh. So these cars, when the GT3 RS, dot two GT3 RS came out, the economy was in a tailspin. They were selling brand new for under sticker. They're now selling for double or triple what the original sticker price was. Actually, 4X if you have a paint to sample. And so there is a financial incentive for people to forget about past information or modifications or use or anything like that. Because the difference between a no-story perfect car and a storied car might be 30 to 50% value. So there's huge financial incentive put on by the buyers, kind of unwittingly, but also they're all party to it, uh, for people to cover up information. So this, like, this is going to keep happening. Um, it's been happening for ages, ages, back in the you know pre-Carfax era and pre-17-digit VIN era, there was cars being wrecked and fixed off the books all the time and and you would really not have any way of knowing it and it still does happen still does happen well and i think it's obviously depressing that you know because i'm thinking of what you're saying from the perspective of somebody who would buy it as a driver and it's like well if it's been maintained and it's you know not torqued or twisted or whatever it's probably right. still fine but to right. somebody who wants a collector grade you know whatever that is a huge deal i don't it seems laughable to me that they even mention track time at all. Just don't put it in there. Like, you don't know. You could say, I've never had it on track. I can't guarantee what's happened before. But it also seems like the information wasn't that hard to find. <laughs> yeah, Th that is a very good point, is if you don't know, don't say. And we see this a lot. Hey, I'm the fifth owner. The car's never had any paintwork. You don't know that. Yeah. The car's never been tracked. Bro, you're the seventh dealer to have it. You can't make that statement conclusively 
Well, it has no overrev, so it hasn't been tracked. You don't know that either. Going down Porsche nerd road here, so we won't go that way. But it, it brings up a discussion I had with a Rolls-Royce rep at Amelia that I think is a good place to put it in. And it's why Rolls-Royce owners are better car guys than Porsche owners. Oh, okay. Yeah, right? This is going to annoy a lot of Porsche purists because they think because they drive manual transmissions, sports cars, and not Luxo barges that they're car people. But Rolls-Royce owners, and, and he was describing how great his clients were, like how much he loved them, how loyal they were. They kept buying cars over and over again. And I said, man, like... I said, don't take this the wrong way, but the reason your buyers are better than Porsche guys is because of depreciation, because they lose their shirt on every car. Rolls Royces are not have no expectation of selling for over sticker, never have, maybe one model here or there, and you know that you're going to lose half its value in the first couple of years. I, I mean, <laughs> they are the definition of depreciation specials. Um, but that's why the guys that buy them are real car guys. Cause they go, Oh, this is what it's going to cost me to own. I'm willing to spend that money for my enjoyment. And I love this car so much that I'm parting with that money. Whereas the Porsche guys, especially the GT guys are going, Oh, well I can own this for free. I could probably even sell it for a hundred K over sticker. I wonder what spec I should get so that somebody else might like it more so that I could maximize my investment. Whereas the Rolls Royce guy is going, Oh yeah, this let's do this different leather and blah, 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 and spend 80 grand on customizing the interior because it makes me feel good. I want to argue with you to play devil's advocate so bad, but I can't <laughs> like, <laughs> They're buying that because it's what they want, whereas it's it's almost unfortunate to be a Porsche enthusiast at this time, because I am because I love the cars. I always have. I, I don't think that's... It may be changed. I don't think it will. But it's depressing to be in this era of everybody who only cares about the spec or resale value or things being so expensive. Like, ugh. I'm not going to get into Rolls Royces, though. I don't have that kind of money. <laughs> <laughs> old or new. I'm not trying to maintain an old Rolls Royce, either. I would like to own a new Rolls Royce. I'd like to have that kind of money that I could just watch it get lit on fire and be driven around in a Luxo barge. That would be awesome. But I don't have that kind of money. So I'm a non-car guy because I buy cars that I can own and not lose my shirt. <laughs> uh, speaking of shirts, let's go to a commercial. Yes, Switchcast is brought to you by Nuts for Sticks. Nuts for Sticks is a brand celebrating the manual transmission in all its forms. So forget those flappy paddles. We like shifting ourselves. Check out our fun and funny stick-themed shirts at nutsforsticks.com and save 10% on your order using the discount code SWITCHCAST. That is nutsforsticks.com and use code SWITCHCAST. For those of you in the audio podcast, Doug was just showing off some of the great merch you can find at nutsforsticks.com. I'm sorry we don't have an easy way to get that to your eyeballs. You're just going to have to go there yourself. There is an easy way. Buy it. <laughs> well, also that. Then you can just look at it. Yes. <laughs> ah, so Nuts for Sticks brings us our question of the week. Tyler, what is that? Well, we have two, so buckle up. Uh, we've got one from Instagram. Oh, he's trying to buckle unsafe um, no airbags uh, so, no seat belts so tom d from instagram uh says doug i was wondering what tips you could give for getting into porsches i've driven a few and really like them but i want to know what makes porsche porsche and who better to ask than you thanks that's ironic timing of that question given <laughs> given our very recent discussion is it the spec that makes a porsche a porsche doug uh no it's a IMS bearings and bore scoring. Whoa. Feeling attacked. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that's a tough one because some people say, like Porsche Club of American Nerds say it's the people. Nah, it's not that. Um, there's some great people and some very pretentious people, um, as with any car club. Um, it's not the company for sure that Porsche as a corporation cares only about themselves and their profit as evidenced by things like, you know, 
the M96 and M97 engine. Um, what makes Porsche Porsche? I think it comes down to the enjoyment of driving and what the car can do over and over and over again for the price point. Um, there's not a 911 on the planet that is better looking than almost any other sports car. Lamborghini, Ferrari, Corvette, you can find a whole bunch of more interesting cars. The 911 has a unique look for sure. And I think that's part of what makes that brand, right? So like Porsche, copy, wrote, trademarked, whatever, their side profile. So you literally can't use just the side profile of a 911 in any advertising material if you are not Porsche. Um, obviously, their racing history is really, really incredible. Um, the legacy of the company, where they came from, what they've accomplished in racing and in, in motorsports is, is pretty fantastic. Um, but that doesn't always translate, right? Like McLaren has an incredible motorsports heritage, but their new cars kind of suck. I wouldn't buy any McLaren other than the F1, and I wouldn't buy that because I can't afford it. So that doesn't always translate. Um, I think that it's that Porsche makes that jump from motorsports to street ownership so well. Like what goes into their racing goes into their street cars to make them better. And they make cars for the most part that you could get in, drive to the track, beat the snot out of it all day, drive home, and then drive to work the next day. And you can just continually enjoy it over and over. And it has that German build quality, German engineering. And it kind of just, it gets the job done for what you want to do. And you enjoy it along the way. And I think that's it. I mean, Corvette does that also, but with just bigger panel gaps and more plastic and, you know... <laughs> Well, and I think too for the long like the the nine eleven formula of the engine over the rear, even though it's inching forward because of physics, and like yeah, having a flat it's six a engine car now. <laughs> yeah, the race cars have been for a little bit, but re rear engine. Um, it's a very unique experience that I've not driven as many cars as you have, but it's something that I find to be very enjoyable, and and that's why I still want more nine elevens. Um, so that it that's like something you can't get in a Corvette, although right. you pay for Snap it. Snap oversteer, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. A good one. Well, there, <laughs> and the maintenance, you know, I was uh, talking to somebody recently that said I almost wish I was a Corvette enthusiast because they're cheaper and easier to maintain. Right, I might right. have a lot more money, but I like what it, I like. It bridges the gap. It's it between a Corvette and a Ferrari in terms of maintenance costs. It's not cheap, but it won't break the bank. And, like, that's why, uh, specifically me, like, I don't want... There's tons of Ferraris I'd like to have or love to drive. I think they're gorgeous. I'm, I've heard the driving experience is wonderful. I've driven a 360, and it was fantastic. I do not want to maintain it. Yeah. I don't want to have a car that I'm terrified about driving all the time, even though I have a 996. <laughs> <laughs> because of I mean, normal I maintenance. <laughs> I did it to myself. Um, thank you. But, like, with the Ferrari, it's like, okay, what other things could break that, like relatively normal maintenance that are just going to be very expensive or every three years you got to drop sure. it and do a timing service or like whatever else. Right. Whereas like you're just puckered with a 996 that, okay, maybe my engine's going to blow up, but everything else is not too bad. <laughs> right. Yeah, I get it. I get it. So what's our second question? All right. This comes to you from switchcast.live, which uh, those of you that do not know what that is, that is your home, your hub, the place to go for all things SwitchCast. So if you want to ask us a question and get straight to Doug, we love to prioritize questions from switchcast.live. And you can also check in and get updated on all of the latest episodes uh, and, and everything else. Ethan does Sign a great up job. Sign our newsletter as well. Yes. Get a newsletter. Yes. Uh, website is... So so great and awesome. Uh, Ethan should uh, work on switchcars.com maybe, but you know we'll get there. <laughs> In due time. Frank. Anyway, David C. Switchcast.live, he asked us, for a pre-facelift W212 E63 AMG wagon engine options, uh, there is M156, which is the naturally aspirated V8, and the M157, which is the twin-turbo V8. 
Is it worth the headache and worries to get one with a twin-turbo V8, knowing that there is a decent amount of issues with the engine that can cause total engine failure, sounds like my 911, which could require a new engine? And what does the twin-turbo V8 take well, or oh, and does it take well to modifications for more power uh, done correctly, of course? Um, okay, so for the non-Mercedes nerds, we're talking about E-Class AMG from, uh, so the W212 is 2010 to 2015. The early ones are a 6.3 liter naturally aspirated V8. The later ones a 5.5 liter bi-turbo V8. To answer his question, I don't know what he's talking about with catastrophic failures with the later engine with the 5.5 bi-turbo. They are pretty dead nuts reliable. Did they, was it like head studs or whatever no, that six was? No, the 6.3s are head studs. Oh, And that okay. can cause, if you don't get them addressed, that can cause catastrophic engine failure. Um, once they're addressed, those engines are pretty bulletproof. But um, So I wanted to check myself on this, so I checked in with Arnie Toman of Cannonball Garage, um, who has, well, our record-breaking Cannonball E63, which is a 5.5 bi-turbo V8 that's heavily modified and has a lot of hard miles. And he said um, that the cam actuators can go bad at around 150,000 miles or so, but that's there's a preventative fix for that. Um, the plastic coolant lines are prone to failure, but again, unless you keep driving after they fail or, you know, schedule a bring a trailer photo shoot and leave it idle, <laughs> you know, that's not going to cause your engine to fail. You shut it off when you see the temps overheat or see the steam coming off and, and fix them. Um, he said the one weak point of that motor is connecting rods, but that's only if you're pumping more than like 800 foot pounds of torque through the engine. So in terms of like stock, those engines go and go and go. And even modified, they take really, really well to modifications. They have the Alpha 9 package with 900 horsepower. That's what we ran in our Cannonball E63. It was detuned. It was only 700 to the wheels. But, I mean, that thing takes it, and it takes it over and over again. It's got 120,000 miles. The last 35,000 are all hard rally and Cannonball miles. So, yeah, I don't, I, maybe there's something on the Internet that, we haven't read, but it's a great engine, and they modify well. So, yeah, if you need help with that, check out Cannonball Garage in Illinois or Ben's house as well. Uh, that's who Arnie uses for a lot of his stuff. But, um, yeah. You had some EV news to update us on, didn't you? Did I? Yes. Um, so this is slightly... Uh, old news, but I want to talk. I want. I think we should talk about it because um, I wasn't here last it's week. It's going to be even older when our audio podcast drops on Monday. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, Porsche has come out with a new version of their Taycan. Taycan. Taken. Taken. Uh, that is taking people's monies. Probably a lot. I don't know if there's a price for the. Well, there is a price for this thing. It's a lot. <laughs> um, so they said that it's uh, most powerful series production Porsche of all time sets of record lap times at Laguna Seca and the Nürburgring. Ooh. So it was close to seven minutes, wasn't it? Yes. It's the got, fastest EV or as fast as four door EV. Yeah. Fastest four door EV. That's well, what it's it was. the fastest four door of any powertrain type at okay. the Nürburgring. Uh, seven minutes or seven hour or seven minutes, seven seconds. <laughs> seven hours. Good gravy. <laughs> I'm used to reading cannibal stuff. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, seven hour or seven minutes, seven seconds. Goodness. 26 seconds faster than the turbo S time. So this is like, okay. Properly quick. Taken turbo GT. All right. With the Visoc package. Oh yes. So they added what a little wing. Do? Uh, you get some buckets up front in your four door saloon. Yep. And they took the rear seats out. So there's the uh, compartments back there. Why? Uh, for weight savings. They've got this oh, thing down to a svelte 4,925 pounds. That's <laughs> it's so heavy. That's like an <laughs> elephant. That's a fat. <laughs> can't, that's. Uh, but this thing can do uh, 60 miles an hour in 2.2 seconds. Don't care. It is. So let me. I. You have thoughts. I can tell. You, you want You want to say things. <laughs> Okay, so I'm sorry. Deleting the rear seats in a four-door sedan, it takes it 
deletes the point of a four-door sedan. That's like my like, favorite part. That is what I did with my Ford Taurus SHO when I was in high school. And I was trying to street race Honda Accords. Oh, did it work? I don't know. <laughs> it was like eight pounds. I, oh. I realized it didn't make any difference, and I couldn't take my friends with me. So I put the dang seat back in. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you buy a four door sedan and then take the seats out? How, wait, hold on. How much extra do people have to pay for this Vysock package to not get the practicality of a four door sedan? So the Vysock starts at two thirty. Uh, to two hundred and thirty thousand uh, dollars for those of you keeping track at home. And why, why not just make an electric nine eleven? It's already two seats. Well, well that's it's actually four seats. Nine eleven has more seats. Oh, they both start at 230 I guess the Vysock package is a no-cost option for the Turbo GT, probably because they're saving money on the rear seats. That's actually amazing. That's probably the first time in a long time that Porsche has not charged their customers to give them less. I wonder... It's funny you mentioned that. I just got done reading an article in not the latest triple zero, but one of the more recent ones where they talk about how the 968 Club Sport and the 964 RS America were lower priced than the normal car, but you got less. It was more motorsports inspired, attempted to be whatever. I wonder if we're going to get back a little to that because Porsche has gone a little crazy with the uh, le less is more money <laughs> thing. <laughs> less is more money. That's that's a good line, Tyler. That's good. I love... So here's my problem with this. It is a fat and heavy EV that I don't care about. But I love that they have produced something for people to buy that is so impractical they took the rear seats out of a sedan. That makes me happy. They put a wing on it. It looks ridiculous, and I'm so happy it exists for that reason. They've identified and fully leaned in to the other uselessness of this luxury barge. Oh, absolutely. That I, very fast luxury barge. And it's got like a thousand horsepower and I just, my eyes glaze over. I don't care because it needs it's that much just, power to go fast. Well, yeah, that's a good point. We, Bentleys are fine with 600 horsepower and they're fast enough, but you know, they're a svelte. Sorry. You already used that word. I'm <laughs> yeah, stealing sorry. your word. They are a petite, like, you know, 4,500 pounds or something like that. What, what was this, 4,900 or 5,900? 4,925. 4,925. Okay, eh, maybe Bentleys are up there, but woof, woof. Oh, I forgot to mention that it does have, at the push of a button, an additional 120 kilowatts of power for 10 seconds. So it's got little EV nitrous. Just so dumb. <laughs> I hope some people get a charge out of that, but... hey -o. Doesn't do anything for me. Uh, a shrewd negotiator this week comes in the form of, well, somebody on Facebook Marketplace. Uh, we had a car for sale, and typically on Facebook Marketplace, even if we identify that we're a dealer, when people want to trade their other cars, they want more than retail for them. In fact, I had somebody want more on trade-in than they were literally advertising the car for. I don't remember what their rationale was, but they said something like, oh, well, your car is overpriced too, or something like that. And I'm like, ah, okay, sure. Um, but uh, this guy wanted to trade in a Gallardo Spider, uh, and it was a decent car, but it had some paint work, and it had higher miles for a Gallardo anyway. And he wanted $165,000 for this car. It was a stick shift, which was cool. So I ran the comps thinking, man, that seems a little high. I was thinking more like 120-ish, maybe 130 on trade. Uh, and of course, people would say, well, you're a dealer. You lowball everyone. However, I ran the comps on classic.com and looked up every single available transaction for the last five years. And there was not one single car that sold for more than $159,000 retail, including all the highfalutin auctions and everything like that. And he wanted the equivalent of 165 on trade. And Ooh. I was like, yeah, no. I'm sorry. There was one that sold for like 400, but it had like 1500 miles and it sold for Meekum. So it's like it, you look at the chart and there was just like, you know, blob of transactions. And then this one way out 
way out in the distance, so I had to throw that one out. It was it was like the you look at it and it's like that super troopers moment where they're at the range and he's like, Oh, how are you shooting today? Oh, just fine. What about that one? Oh, don't worry about that little one up there. Just, <laughs> yeah. So Carry on. but the, the all of the other hundred some odd transactions and I'm just like I don't I don't even know how to respond to that. And like he reached out a week later and you know, said, Hey, I'm interested. I'm like, I'm not, not at that number. <laughs> like I took it that you weren't serious. He's like, Well, yeah, I didn't want to give away the farm on the first offer. It's like, okay, well, it's like you're trying to give me the land and keep the house. Like that wasn't even close. <laughs> but uh Yeesh. the 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 brilliant the the best part about that day was like an hour after he reached back out, we sold the car to somebody else. So I was like, sorry. <laughs> He's gone. Yeah. But I mean, it's it the people that doesn't work, right? If you're selling the car or buying a car, starting in the stratosphere or in the basement does not work because people will not take you seriously. Now, if you use a real estate agent to buy or sell a house, they will tell you this, that if you lowball a seller, they're just not going to respond because there's eight other people making offers and the seller is either going to be insulted personally or they're just going to think, well, you're an idiot or don't have the money or whatever reason they come up with to not respond. So you're shooting yourself in the foot by trying this negotiation tactic. Well, in the car business, people don't have agents to make these recommendations. So they throw out these silly offers and they wonder <laughs> why they either get blocked or ghosted or cussed out or whatever. Like it doesn't work. And oh. listing your car too high doesn't work either. Even though people say, well, anyone can make an offer. And it's like, no, people won't make an offer because they'll see this astronomical listing price and just go, eh, they don't want to sell it. They'll just drag you in the comments. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, your wife, you had to tell your wife it was for sale, huh? Yeah. yeah somebody's dreaming. Yep. Yep. I could have bought one five years ago <laughs> for that, but I didn't. <laughs> Oh boy! Uh, on the good side of the shrewd negotiator, I I thought this was viral marketing genius. Naples Motorsports uh, has made the rounds of the internet this last week by offering a free 2018 Rolls Royce Wraith with the purchase of a 2021 Bugatti Chiron. Are you telling me that the margin on the Chiron? <laughs> is enough to absorb the cost of a Wraith? I guess, I wait, how expensive are those? That's so uh, they're asking $3.85 million for the Chiron, oh. and it's pre-owned, so I would say they've probably built in at least 10% margin, maybe more to account for the possibility of people. You know, they probably want to close with a net 10% margin. So they may have 15 or 20% from their asking price to their, you know, what they you know, what they paid for it in order to leave room for negotiation. But the a Wraith, the pre-owned Wraith goes for around 200K plus or minus, depending on miles, condition, options. So that's 5% of that price. So it's... What a deal. Yeah. Yeah. You could probably just ask for the 200 grand discount and they would also give that to you. But this is good marketing, offering a 200 grand discount and nobody cares. Nobody's I, gonna repost that or talk about it on a podcast. That's true. I love the photo of this uh, Sharon with the special offer banner in the top right corner, as if it's on clearance. You I'm know, not gonna lie. If I was buying a Bugatti, I think it'd be a nice gesture to get a, a Rolls Royce Wraith for the wife or whatever. You know, if I lived in Naples and had Bugatti money, that would be the kind of thing that my wife might drive. Yeah. Um, we all going to pull money, guys? We're going to go get this? I mean, you buy a Porsche at a dealer, you might not even get a free hat. So, <laughs> Oh, yeah. They make you pay for that Porsche design hat. <laughs> yes. 50 bucks, yeah. buddy. A license plate frame, $35. Golly, a pen, 300 Yeesh. Golly. But people pay it. They eat that stuff up. They eat that stuff up. Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, I don't think... Think, I don't think we have time to get to Scaminator this week because that that is a longer discussion. Yeah, it is somehow already nearly the end of the podcast. We got like ten minutes to go. Right, 
And that's fine because that wasn't in our, our title, so we're not being clickbait or whatever. So we'll have to put that one off till next week, and that will give us a little bit more time to get to questions for people that have them. So um, with that, let's get to the props and flops of the week, and that after that it will end our uh, audio recorded segment. But for those of you watching live, we'll hang out with you and do some live Q&A. So... Props and Flops, brought to you by Switch Cars. And you know it, Switch Cars is the enthusiast's dealership where we buy, sell, consign, service, and a store. Only cars that we like ourselves. So check out our handpicked inventory at switchcars.com. And Doug, what is our pick of the week from Switch Cars Inventory? Our pick of the week is a bargain. Um, you could probably... We could probably throw this in if you bought the Lamborghini Diablo, but it is a uh, BMW Z4 3 liter inline six convertible with a six speed manual. And oh, it's Ethan. Finished. Oh, yeah, Ethan. Yeah. Ethan, my uh, guy. You have to learn to drive stick. I'm l- um, I know how to drive stick. <laughs> Are you nuts for sticks, Ethan? I'm not so sure. I, I, you I know have how to, to drive refresh stick. yourself. Yeah. Yes. Why? <laughs> Okay, it's been a few months since I've driven stick. I'll, I'll concede. That. Okay. Anyway, it's finished in a beautiful ice bluish. I don't know the color code on tan interior. Uh, it's got like forty thousand miles. Uh, Chromey wheels, stop tech brakes, intake exhaust, strut tower brace. It's a really nice car with some nice upgrades. You taking th- notes, Ethan? I think we sold it today already. To Ethan. We didn't even list it. No. <laughs> oh, no. okay. But uh, it, it is pending sale. So sorry about that. I already had that one in my show notes. But it Man. is a really cool car, and we listed it fifteen grand. I mean, it is a it is a bargain. Nah, Z fours are sweet. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you could have that or a Corvette C five with a hundred thousand miles or a Mazda Miata. I think I'd take the Z four. So don't oh, tell yeah. Hank that. Uh, our flop of the week. What is our flop of the week, Tyler? All right. So uh, recently, there's been some drama about the uh, Houston uh, Coffee and Cars, I think it is called. Sure. uh, For banning modern muscle cars. Ooh. Uh, I did find the post has been taken down. Oh. But I don't think they've walked it back. Did they unban them? I don't think so. There was Uh, just too many controversial comments people were angry (laughs) people were very upset and i I feel like they're saving lives by doing this though i think so uh i understand what the the organizers of this event are going for and i think in a sense we may have some common ground so why why were they doing what are they did they specify what modern muscle car like what year this starts or what kind of modern muscle cars what's the criterion here they essentially said challengers chargers camaros and mustangs <laughs> they didn't give a date but i'm pretty sure we all can <laughs> imagine what they're talking about the probably i would imagine post 2005 retro refreshes of all these different cars that people tend uh to leave cars and coffee in and maybe contact some pedestrians on their way out mm. uh in a way that is not conducive to keeping your limbs unbroken um <laughs> i love how wordy you tried to get with that <laughs> uh so they they've they're very intensely against shows of power like you know power slides and burnouts and and revving to leave like they want to keep this to be a family friendly event and that that's their whole point right <laughs> but yikes i get it i get it I mean, around here we have that issue, but it's BMWs and Miatas, so yeah, it's I, surprisingly not Mustangs. Because I, I think the, the the thing is, is they're not they're not uh, curate. They're trying to curate the cars and assume that's going to curate the people. But what you actually need to do is curate the people, which at the scale of a cars and coffee is impossible. So the answer, Doug, is smaller events with your groups of friends and maybe extended friends and none of this super trend chasing clout boy blech, that cars and coffee has become well but it, you can't make it profitable with a small event and that's that's one inherent issue is that people are trying to make this a business not trying there are people that have made a business out of this and you need hundreds or thousands of cars to show up 
to get sponsors and vendors. So I understand that, but I also rebel against it. I mean, when we started Cleveland Cars and Coffee in 2009, it was very organic. There was no official organizers and there was definitely no sponsors. In fact, I wouldn't let anybody put flyers in cars or do anything commercial in any way. Um, and it was great. And people were like, oh man, you should, we should find a new place and we could get 500 cars. Have you seen Dallas cars and coffee? Have you seen this cars and coffee? We could be like that. I'm like, no, I don't want to be. I this feel like great. it's jumped the shark for for the most part. Like I don't have any desire to go to these events. They're too big. You attract the wrong crowd because the the thing is, so is what like, is the wrong crowd, Tyler? It's Are the you being people hurting. For, no, no, I. It's the folks like trying to show off and and get famous on the internet for doing a, a shows of power that they cannot handle. Okay, I've done shows of power leaving cars and coffee in Cleveland You've, before it was cool and before <laughs> I, well. There you I go. guess it isn't cool, but <laughs> before it wasn't cool. Yeah, we'll say that. Um, <laughs> and it was fun. Which is, but the problem is, is you are something that you can't really filter for or curate. Is like you know how to handle a vehicle. You you've been through, you you've driven a lot. Allegedly. You've been through some some driving schools. Like you you've been on track. Like you you know how to handle the dynamics of a vehicle. Well, I also know when not to do it. Yes. There's a time and a place. So I think there's it's a skill issue and also a, 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 a logic issue. Judgment. <laughs> judgment. That's yeah. what I was going for. Yeah. I had to make my skill issue joke. That was more on my brain People cells. People with went. 20% APR on their Hellcat don't have good judgment to begin with. No. Well, and that's the, my problem with this is I, I'm all for some more gatekeeping to keep things more organic, but like the cars are not the problem. There can be somebody who's just such, like, the type of car enthusiast that we would love to hang out with, and their favorite car is a modern Camaro. Right. And that's fantastic. Chris Rattini, he's a regular listener, comes yeah. to the podcast, he's got a challenger, we don't hold that against no, him. No, drive what you like, just yeah. don't be an idiot. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one, and I mean, I get where they're coming from, I'm sure it raised a lot of ire uh, from people, but I, I, I think... So were people crying like racist or discriminatory? What, what was the opposition? Or was it just like, oh, you don't like cheap cars or some, I don't know. Is it okay to discriminate against a type of car? Like if I have a Cars and Coffee, I don't really want Subarus and Audi sedans there because they're everywhere. They're not interesting. What, what I mostly saw is the the shtick that it was trying to gatekeep against, uh, to keep the, the show to be only rich people or uh, only old people who can afford these cars. So it's like trying to keep the kids out. And like that's the biggest thing I saw. There was also a lot of people that were okay with it because they said, I don't want to see traffic in my cars and coffee, which I thought was kind of a very intense and humorous take. Was that you? Is no, that no. You would it, was, say? it was not me. <laughs> Maybe I, that's why I thought it was no, funny. I, and I've said that for a while. And and the, the big question is, how do you manage that? Is I don't want to go to a car event and see things that I would see at a local dealer lot. Even, you know, an Audi dealer or whatever. Um, maybe there's an R8 in the showroom, but if there's, you know, five S5s out front, I don't want to see those at Cars and Coffee. But it's a difficult thing to tell people no and to be like, well, your car isn't good enough. It doesn't mean... They are not a car person. It's just like car shows are for what people don't see every day. And it has nothing to do with money. You can bring a Nissan Figaro there. It's a ten, twenty thousand dollar, you know, car. It used to be common. It's not common anymore. And it's really unique and interesting. But the guy with a Nissan Figaro or the McLaren or whatever probably isn't gonna come if he's gonna risk getting hit or getting secondhand vape juiced from you know, a, a challenger owner, Subaru owner, something like that. So I, <sighs> well, and that's like, that's where I'm kind of, I, I was kind of getting with the, the jump, the shark thing is like what I, I found cars and coffee as a car show. Like those are two different things. Cars and coffee historically, or should be a gathering of like-minded people to get up, maybe get up early or, or take a, take a drive to a destination and all hang out and just enjoy the hobby and enjoy their cars. Right. That's what I go for. I've seen enough Huracans. I've seen enough Aventadors. I don't care. I want to see the people. Right. And now that that's my, pre like a lot of people probably want to go and see 
crazy things. Like I, I imagine being a kid and getting to see some of these cars and coffee fields and I would blow my mind and it'd be so cool. But like that type of show is something that requires curation at this point where maybe you have to have an invite list or charge a ticket price or something to make it a show versus just a casual gathering. Right. No, I, I think that's valid. I think making charging would, <laughs> that would do it real quick. Or just charging an annual membership fee or something like that, whereas you have a member card. And it could be cheap, but that'll eliminate a lot of people. And it'll make people angry, but keep it free for spectators. And the people that have the cars that these people want at this Cars and Coffee can afford a $5 <laughs> ticket or whatever. You know, just yeah. something. Slight barrier to entry. Um, so I see what they were going for with this. I think it maybe was not the best move, but we'll see how it pans out. It's tough. It doesn't matter how you do it. You're wrong. But uh, that's why I don't run Cars and Coffee anymore because I just I was like, you know, what? it's it's become too big and there's too many people with opinions and I just don't care. I hmm. want to hang out with cool people, even if I don't know them and see interesting cars. And like I don't even bring if I don't have something interesting or I bring something less interesting, I'll just park it in the ancillary lot. Yeah, like, I, I don't need the status of backing into my parking space in whatever, like, yeah. So, yeah. but you don't have to have a Ferrari to be interesting, nor does having a Ferrari make you interesting as a person or make you a good car person or whatever. So that, that, that there's a tough thing too. Like at what point does it go the other way where you're getting overrun by paint to sample Porsche 911s where everybody thinks they're awesome because they spent 150 grand or 300 grand to spec out their car, but there's 18 of them. Yeah. One of the comments I saw was so. like, the last Cars and Coffee I went to had a row of 30 GT3s. And it's like, wow, that's probably... That's traffic at this point. Yeah. <laughs> if everybody's special, then nobody is. Mm. So, mm. Yeah, but they're the only one with that CXX interior option. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Coming back to my point, the Porsche guys are just Corvette guys with more money. Oh, uh, prop of the week. Uh, Lamborghini Countach Turbo, one of only two in the world, uh, sold on Rally Road. Now, Rally Road is an automotive investment platform. They are, in fact, registered with the SEC, and they sell shares of vehicles that they own. They actually purchase these vehicles, document them, put them in a warehouse, and then offer them up as a, essentially an IPO per vehicle. And anyone can go on, register an account, and buy a share. They typically divide them up into 5,000 shares per vehicle. So it's affordable and easy to get in. Well, at some point, these vehicles can sell if somebody gives them a buyout offer. And this Countach Turbo, which they had purchased for, I think, around 600 k was the IPO, sold for a record $1.18 million. Whoa. Dollars. Hmm. Yes. So I doubled my money on this sale. Only problem is I only bought one share, so I made a hundred bucks. Yeah, <laughs> don't spend that all in one place now, you hear? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So that that was interesting. And it the timing was odd as well. It was within a day or two of uh Marcello Gandini's passing. So I don't know if that was coincidental or had anything to do with it, but uh Anyway, that was that was interesting. So a lot of people made a lot of money who uh, invested in this platform. Um, related, I also have shares in a Diablo SE30 Yoda, and I think I got in around four fifty on that one. And it recently jumped right after this Countach Turbo sale from a six hundred fifty k valuation to one point eight million. Whew. And then back to an 800K value all within about a week. Highlighting one of the drawbacks of this platform is that anybody can get in and price manipulation can occur with a couple hundred bucks because the market cap of this vehicle is determined based on the last trade, even if it was just one share. So somebody could be like, oh, okay, I'm going to drive the value on this up. It only cost me 300 bucks. So that was an interesting thing to watch. I tried to double my money real quick, but... I mean, the, you did. Well, I did. I tried to <laughs> double my money on the Diablo shares, but uh, I, I knew it probably wouldn't happen because I'm like, this car isn't actually worth it. So um, anyway, it's it's a fun thing to play. 
Um, it's less risky than Bitcoin if you actually know what you're doing in terms of like, oh, this car is worth X. Here's where the market cap is based on the share value. But, you know, in terms of just guesswork, it's it's a tough one. Um, and I wouldn't recommend getting in at the IPO price because you're essentially paying full retail plus their built in expenses of holding the car expecting it to go up in value. So you only will make money on your shares if the car actually goes up in value over time. So I've bought all mine at like a 30 to 50% discount off of the IPO price. And, you know, that's, yeah, buy low, sell high. So anyway, those of you with questions, uh, stick around for Tip Talk. That's our live Q&A after the regularly recorded audio portion of the show. Uh, to the rest of you, thank you for being here and listening to the show. Thank you to my co-host, official supplier of banter, Tyler Sanders, our producer, Ethan Huffnagel, our sponsors, BoxCast, Nuts for Sticks, SwitchGuard, Celebrity Machines, Parallel Printworks, and Stephen Holm Woodworking. Our bumper music is provided by Emily and Ivory. You can stream their full album on Spotify or SoundCloud and see them live at Collision Bend Brewery this Friday, March 22nd at 7 p.m. This episode will be available next Monday in audio format wherever you listen to podcasts. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next Wednesday at 8 p.m. as we look forward to edifying, educating, and entertaining you on the drive of your life. It's almost like I've done that before. Yeah, look at that. Can you say it in your sleep yet? No, I haven't even memorized it. I have to still have to read it, but it's like you get into a groove. Know what coming? Yeah, could have fooled me. Sounded pretty natural over here. But uh, how's YouTube? Looking? Oh, we got a handful of questions from Great. the YouTubes. Good. All right, Anthony Russo asked earlier tonight, uh, Doug, what is the future market looking like for '60s and '70s British cars like N- MGBs, Triumph, TR6s, and such? Uh, that's a real slippery slope, um, mostly because they leak oil a lot. <laughs> so uphills, downhills, leaking oil, slippery slope. See what I did there? Um, <laughs> it was even better because you explained it more. <laughs> I have to. Um, it's a classic dad joke thing as you explain it, even if people get it. Oh, I love it. Uh, <laughs> it's top tier comedy right there. I'm giving you more time to think about Whenever, to that question. Well, no, I'm trying to decide how smart Alec to be more than I already have been. I don't have a crystal ball. I, well, I do. It's in for service. Um, mm. Does it have bore scoring? Did you check? Yeah, it needs a timing belt replacement. Oof. Yikes. So uh, I don't friggin' know. I, anybody who says they do know doesn't, unless they are controlling the market. Um, it, doesn't it just go back to the buy what you think is cool and yeah. other people may follow? And if they do, cool. If they don't, at least you have something that you enjoy. I don't think there's major upside. Let's put it that way. There may be a few special models like the Austin Healey 3000, the Jaguar XK120, 140, 150 that um, are just so beautiful and timeless that they will increase in value. But that also goes back to buy what you like, buy what you find intriguing because the rest of the market will eventually catch on and go, oh, yeah, how did that car escape my notice um and there are continued driving events like the colorado grand the mila milia um the california mila that provide experiences uh where you can enjoy these cars and i think that's going to drive value for some of these historic cars is people wanting experiences that they can't buy so to speak but you can buy them. You just have to buy a car that's eligible and then have these unique driving experiences. So I think that'll that'll help to drive the value. Um, I don't think there's any major opportunity to jump in and like make a fortune on them. But because they are high maintenance and they require a special type of car guy and a special type of love. <laughs> the, you know, yes, <laughs> the, you got the British car manufacturers, you know, they all got uh Initials, you got MG, you got TVR, you got TLC. <laughs> lots and lots uh, of TLC. I can appreciate them from afar, away from the oil spill. Um, so Priyam Patel asked earlier tonight, uh, guys, opinion for a first car, please. And I thought these three Corvette! options were... It's, it's probably no, a better option a than any three of these. First car. Uh, so there's three options. Okay. Considering a 635 CSI... An M635 CSI or a 944 Turbo. 
Open to other suggestions. 635 CSI. Are those even reliable? Yes. They're amazing. They're yes. gorgeous. But like, are yes. they? Oh, yeah. Probably cheaper to maintain than a 944 turbo. turbo. Oh, for absolutely. Yes. Yeah, definitely a 635 CSI. They're pretty. The 944 turbo is not pretty. Oh, God, I love this um, 6 Series so much. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Gorgeous. 635 CSI. I like that. I like that option a lot. Heck yeah. Yeah. Old school inline sixes, man. You cannot break. It's like 30 plus years of BMW making inline sixes that were just robust as all get out. Yeah. And then they started adding stuff. Like turbos for <laughs> yes. emissions. Oh, don't get me <laughs> oh, started no, what have on we this. Done? <laughs> the government. The government mandated this crap and then cars got unreliable. How does that help the environment when we're having turbos leaking oil and throwing out auto parts that we have to replace and junking cars because they're unreliable because they're trying to do what they have to do to meet cafe standards when they were mm. I like turbocharged performance cars those can be cool but the normal cars naturally aspirated is king all the time can uh, you imagine if BMW is still making an inline six like just like a three liter inline six isn't Mazda making one now Probably. Mazda is really reliable. They're one of the best new car options out there because they haven't gone overly complex and crazy. Uh, I'm Racer 1993. Uh, that's a good date. Uh, year I was born. Uh, what is Doug's thoughts on the Miami Vice McBurney Ferrari Daytonas built on Corvette C3s? Would you consider them kit car junk or something that would make Hank's world meltdown? <laughs> 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 both <laughs> that's not original i remember watching that show <laughs> uh i think they're pretty cool and there's only a few of them right because the first season they did the fake ones and then ferrari got so angry about it that they gave them actual ferraris to use so yeah yeah that would be um that would be a really neat collector piece to have. I do wonder how many are left. It's kind of like the uh, the Modena Spider that was built specifically for um, the Ferris Bueller Day Off movie, right? Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. fake 250 short wheelbase, wheelbase, wheelbase <laughs> California Spider, but it has its own cult following now because of what it was. Is it a kit car? Absolutely or a fake Ferrari, a replica, whatever you want to call it, but it has its own lore now. They've entered their own segment of collectability. And the real ones are just so unbelievably expensive. Well, yes, yes, that's true. It's it's probably the best fake one out there short of getting a 250 chassis Ferrari and just rebodying it as a California Spider. And you can buy one for 200K plus minus, and a Cal Spider is 10 million. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the Ferris Bueller fakie. <laughs> Devin Ruckus says, I broke multiple late 80s, early 90s BMW i6s just saying. Well, Devin, I'd like to know what the heck you were doing with them. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't count. <laughs> how many miles on them when you broke them? <laughs> yes. Uh, and there's how a good, off, far off the ground was the car? There's a good few on Instagram here that I want to get to. This one's been said a few times. Hot take, the new Countach. Yes, it shouldn't be called that, but it sure is pretty. I wish the Aventador looked like that this whole time. How good would an SVJ trim look? In a Mura? The new Mura? The Countach. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. Where was my brain? I was thinking the new Mura concept. Um, still, yeah. It would, it would be pretty sexy. I like the design of it. He's not wrong. The Aventador is... I'm going to say it. It's ugly. The new Countach looks cool, but hmm. the fact that it's $2.5 million is ridiculous because it is... Mm, it's a rebodied Aventador. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I said it. Um, yeah, no, it's it's not a hot take that that car looks good. It does look good. It's just I didn't see the value proposition, but 25 people or however many they made did see it, so... They would have just made the Aventador look like that in the first place. It would have been pretty all right. Yeah, that would have been cool. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on the Ferrari 550 and the market for U.S. versus Euro? Uh, buy a Euro. <laughs> Aren't they like much cheaper? 50% discount. No. Yeah. Heck yeah. Um, yeah, go watch my bourbon video about that. I like the Ferrari <laughs> 550. I love it. I think it's one of the most beautiful cars they ever made. But at 200 plus compared to an Aston Martin DB9 or DB7, the Aston Martin is a far better value proposition. I don't know that the 550 is overpriced. I think the Aston Martin's underpriced because um, for 200 grand, that's a heck of a lot of a car. But you can get a good Euro spec car for 150 plus minus, and so what? You can't sell it to California. Whatever. And typically, the Euro cars had better options and stuff anyway because. They actually have taste over there where we just buy red tan with Daytona seats over and over and over freaking again. <laughs> and you can get like blues and greens and carbon racing seats and all sorts of fun stuff that they built out. Oh, the green Europe. ones. Every once in a while, a green one pops up in my Instagram feed and I just have to stop and drool for a moment. Oh, mm. so good. Well, and a lot of people are trying to take advantage of the disparity in value, not only between the Euros and the U.S. cars, but just the overall European market for high-end cars is far softer than it is here. And a lot of people are importing the Euro 550s to the U.S., which is driving the market down somewhat on the Euro cars. So, yeah, I, I'd, I'd save the coin. I'd buy a Euro 550 and have enough left over to buy another car. Uh, yeah, a, a lot of these come down to specific questions on, uh, uh, specific brands, makes and models. Uh, this one asks if you had any good police stories recently. Recently? Yeah. Uh, good question. We can come back to that. You can, you can mull over that. Uh, this, this should be an easy one for you. Unrelated to anything, but, uh, crap can wants to know Elvis or Beatles. Beatles. Yeah, right. They were a real band. Wow. Shots fired. How about that? Is the E39 M5 market dead? How is it? E39 M5? No, it's not dead. It's kind of nutty for good cars. I remember back in my day. <laughs> I could buy one for 15 grand. <laughs> yeah, and it yeah, wasn't. No. Yeah, we so. sold like a 200,000 mile car for like 20. Oh, so those so. are s probably the best looking sedan ever made. So that, pretty. That car is really good to drive too. Oh, really, really, really fantastic. I would take one over an E46 M3. Speaking of uh, E46 M3s, VLM Chris wants to know how many inquiries you got on the LSB. E46. Uh, <laughs> yeah, probably half a dozen. <laughs> and you put right in there, not available. Everybody was trying to be funny, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. This one's right up your alley here. Would love to get your opinion on buying a 35 to 40K price wise DB9. Have previously owned a C6 and a C7, but looking for something different. Okay. What opinions? Is, uh, my opinion is yes. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, right. <laughs> You're uh, you can't get a stick for that amount. You're going to be buying a Touchtronic, but it's better than the garbage sequential that was in the Aston Martin Vanquish. So it, I mean, it it's reliable enough. It's just an automatic transmission, but it's a lot, a lot of car for the money. I don't know who said this. Maybe it was John who just recently joined the Peanut Gallery. But the DB9 is a car that you can buy for sub 50k and go to most valets if you're not in like new york or los angeles or whatever and still have status because it just looks so exotic and it looks modern you pull up and they park you right out front john was it you that said that, I have said that before. we were part there, there was a discussion around that topic but status. yeah but it's a it's a fantastic engine it's a really great car i think so yeah uh, what's your favorite summer tire, brand and model? Michelin Pilot 4S. We did a TikTok on that, I feel like, at some point. Here's, well, there's also this stuff. TikTok account that's Michelin Pilot 4S that <laughs> just it. comments Michelin Pilot 4S <laughs> on like the, every video. The Volvo enthusiast group. Yes. <laughs> I, I drive Volvo every yes. single video. It's like the first comment. It's like within two minutes of uploading a video, this guy. Seriously? Like, that's amazing. Volvos are great. It's, it's not me. Pretty I thought it might have been. No, nah, the Pilot 4S is great. Continental Extreme Sport is my favorite cheap summer tire. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I don't need Pilot 4S's on my 996. 
I can't have go them, fast uh, enough. Nine and seven, but I don't think I paid for them. <laughs> I haven't paid for tires in a long time on my cars. So I got a free set that I'm putting on my Corvette shortly. Yeah, rub it in. Uh, Rubber it in. <laughs> oh my! Can make. All right. Um, Doctor Softy Softy wants to know what's the best. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's Dr. Softy. I know it is. Does he market the purple pill? (laughs) (laughs) Peanut Gallery just said, that's who you see after four hours. (laughs) Oh, amazing. (laughs) Oh. That's it. (laughs) Doug's gone, everybody. Uh, All right. So... uh, Senior Softy here wants to know what's the best non GT Porsche sports car and why is it the 944? Uh, what do they mean by non GT? I got Cayman R slash Boxster Spider. That's my answer. Yeah, you do love Boxster Spider. Yeah. The Cayman R's are pretty sweet. Yep. Yep. Pretty, pretty sweet. That's my answer. It's not the 944. <laughs> Look, I have the best 944, and it's I mean, still if, not as good as one yeah. of those. Uh, I, I want to get this one in because it's been asked a few times. Uh, hey, Doug, appreciate your content. Switch Cars has Aww. inspired me since the website was made in 1973. <laughs> 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 I love a good burn. I love a good burn. That's good. That's Listen, pretty good, Hank man. founded That's, the company. It's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> that was Hank's name. Hank hand coded that website, uh, but it he wants fine. Pay ten dollars for it. Yeah. He wants to ask if uh, you think older Audi S fours and on. RS. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> it, it still has a feature where where you can send a fax from the website. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> direct fax. <laughs> We were ahead, yeah. The site was ahead of its time. We, sh- for we should put really. like fake wood paneling on the website too. <laughs> <Yeah>. Period. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> really good. That might be one of the funnier burns I've seen about the website. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that might be a that might be a highlight. Yeah, that that's might pretty be a highlight. Real. All right. What's the real uh, question? I wanted to ask if you think older Audi S4s and RS4s are a good buy right now. The M3 market is insane. Uh. Yes, um, I feel like they've always been a good buy. Just budget for maintenance. They are, they can be heavy. They can be heavy on maintenance. Um, no, <laughs> there's no can. They are. They're expensive to keep up. Uh, I've been tempted to pick one up a number of times, and I think if I babied my cars, I would have bought one. But it would have been a daily winter driver and I would have beat the snot out of it and a semi-fragile car is not the car to beat the snot out of that's why I never bought a Volvo V70R John Ficarra talked me out of it because he said the front suspension design is just awful and you will just eat control arms and uprights and hubs and like so S4 kind of the same thing like I just I love those cars Um, I particularly like the 4.2 liter V8, but you know, the the Turbo Six is pretty cool too, and I like the design. I wouldn't want one at Cars and Coffee, right? No Audi sedans, but <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I think they're a great buy, but I think they're held down like a number of other cars because people understand how much they cost to keep running. So that would be my only consideration. Uh, yeah, I mean there there are a few more on Instagram. Uh, we can we can get let's, to let's pick the best one. Some of the, some of them are pretty quick hitters. Okay, um, unless you can do like rapid fire, a couple of them. Sure. Uh, the question is if your answers can uh, be conducive to that. Uh, what are your thoughts Whoa. on the? Uh, hey, yikes! Now. Well, no, wait, no, that is because some of these like it's hard to. Uh, I mean, these questions, they're hard to give a quick answer to. Look, just because he said you can't drive stick doesn't mean you need to be rude. <laughs> what is your What is your thoughts? What are your thoughts? Creed thoughts. On the, <laughs> w, what was the website? <laughs> www.creedthoughts.net.gov forward slash creed thoughts. What is your <laughs> thoughts on the LT6 engine? Uh, sweet. <laughs> 
I don't know. I'm not qualified to answer that. I'm not an engineer. I think every LS and LT engine ever made is fantastic. It's better than any Porsche engine ever made. <laughs> well, now let's maybe okay, calm except down. The GT1 what about block? the Metzgers, my guy? Okay, fine. Here you go. This one will be fun. High recommendations. I just, I, sorry. A, no, no, a, a pushrod V8 that can make gobs of power, not break, and generally can get 30 miles per gallon. Like, I'll still take a flat six. Makes better noises too. Uh, it's debatable. You, it's not a debatable. good flat six. Sounds amazing. You have to spend a hundred grand to get a good flat six. <laughs> I can't argue with that. But I'd rather have the sound of a Metzger for a, a V eight. That's just me though. Listen, there's a reason that I sit on the right and you sit on the left. It's because I'm right. <laughs> wow. Yes. You're gonna take it's that the second down. time tonight he said, I can't argue with that. I mean, I can. I want but like, to, but I can't do it. It's, it <laughs> I can't argue with the cheapness and the, rel- che- the cheap cost, the, the low cost, also the cheapness of the interior. And the, uh, <laughs> wow. uh, and Not the, in the C8. I don't want a C8. Oh, my gosh. That, ugh, get out of here. That's not a real Corvette. This is degrading quickly, Ethan. You should say No, this, this is great. I'm <laughs> glad I asked this question. <laughs> Hi. He just wants us to fight. That's all Ethan wants I is do, chaos. I do, like, I do like baiting you guys here with some uh, you dangle the carrot in front of the ham- whatever the thing is. Hi. Recommendations on what to do with an old Scion XB. What should you do with that? Does it run? <laughs> Presumably. It's just old. <laughs> <laughs> Those are front wheel uh, drive, aren't they? Don't lower it. Don't LS swap it. <laughs> Recommendations <laughs> on what to do. Ooh, I got it. Here we go. <laughs> yes. You've seen those like Toyota Century and Toyota Crown Japanese hearses that look like a Buddhist <laughs> temple on the back. Yeah. That is what you should do with it. Mm. Cut the back oh. off, El Camino style, giant Japanese apartment on the back. Yeah. yeah. Temple, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Buddhist temple. It's good. Yes. And you should get like a priest's outfit or something like get a get a robe and go around and offer religious services. You could do weddings. You could do weddings and funerals. You could be a whole life service. The beginning and thing. the end. <laughs> and the middle, too. You could do... <laughs> yeah. Counseling and meditation sessions, the whole the whole thing. Make enough money to buy a real car. All right, we pulling the plug on this, guys? 